All right. Welcome, everyone. It is Alex Hort and David Morgan. We're going to have a chat about oil. And we've been thinking about this for a fair amount of time. And Alex, I'm just going to turn it over to you. Why don't you show us what you found? Just real basic stuff, more of a conversation. Uh, so go ahead and share your screen and let's look at the current oil situation. Yeah, we've definitely uh, been seeing oil prices uh, skyrocketing. And, uh, you know, just recently, uh, apparently due to this war in Ukraine, we saw how uh, crude oil, basically they're pretty much giving away barrels of oil for free. It actually went negative. I think it was negative $30. They're giving oil away for free. So oil was actually uh, cheaper than water at one point, only I think like about a year ago or two years ago. And now we're seeing over $100 oil. So pretty much we're just seeing there's huge profits uh, being made off oil now and they actually seem to be losing money at one point. So now they're really, uh, you know, it's just skyrocketed. And uh, basically they're saying the reason why it's skyrocketing is because of the war with Ukraine and everything. Uh, but I really don't understand why, uh, you know, the oil prices are surging so much in the United States, you know, for gasoline anyway when Russia only produces, sends 7% of all oil that the United States uses uh, to this country. So it seems pretty odd. So I kind of want to get your thought on that, David. Why do you think, you know, gasoline prices are skyrocketing uh, so much in the United States while Russia only sends 7% of its oil here? Because it's not an inclusive market. It's a world price. So you're right. What you said, or you're thinking, if I understand you correctly. I mean, we really, <clears throat> Russian oil doesn't affect us at all. It does very, very minutely. But since it's a world set price, if it's harder to get in other jurisdictions, other nation states, then it's going to affect the world price. That's the, that's the answer. But I think you've got some interesting uh, outlooks. Why don't you show us um, what uh, you showed me earlier on the, on the pre-interview with uh, the global map of what the oil reserves look like presently? Sounds good. So here's a global map. Uh, this just shows the biggest crude oil reserves and billions of barrels. Um, and right now it seems like Venezuela, which is a really tiny country, seems to have the biggest oil reserves, followed by uh, the Saudis. And then Canada actually has pretty big reserves. So, uh, And we're also seeing something pretty big happening right now is actually uh, Biden has been eyeing uh, Venezuelan oil. There's been some talks that maybe the United States might start importing uh, Venezuelan oil. And I guess they've gotten rid of a whole bunch of sanctions uh, while they put on a lot of sanctions on Russia uh, for some reason. But now I guess there's some pushback and some stuff going on uh, saying the U.S. has retreated on Venezuelan oil talks after Maduro meeting criticism because a lot of newspaper articles were talking bad about what Biden was doing. Uh, but I guess it remains kind of to be seen. What do you think is going to happen in the uh, Venezuelan oil market. Uh, David, it really seems like a really untapped big market with oil. Do you think, uh, you know, the United States will start to import Venezuelan oil in the future or the near future? Or do you think they will try to basically keep the ban on basically saying we're not going to take any of their oil? Yeah, I'll go ahead and leave that uh, chart up because I want to make some comments on those numbers. Sounds uh, good. There's a lot there to unpack. I do think that the U.S. will not use Venezuelan oil right away, uh, but that I could be wrong. I'm not an oil expert. What is in plain sight for everybody is that Venezuela has about eight times as much oil as the United States. You really see this talk about the U.S. being energy independent and all that. Well, if you look at this and you look at the reserves, the U.S. doesn't have very much reserves. It's got, like I said, Venezuela has like about eight times the reserves the U.S. has. Canada has, what, four times as much. You know, yeah. I mean, this is interesting to note. So there's that part of it. The other part about Venezuela that most people don't talk about unless you're somewhat studied in oil, which I am somewhat, is that it's really heavy oil. It's not West Texas Intermediate. It's not Brent. It is pretty tarry to give it a slang term, which is not, which takes more you know, energy to refine and all that. It's still there, it's still usable, but it's not, um, not the world benchmark by a long shot. So not oils are created equal. 
you know, there's light, sweet crude, and then there's, you know, heavier crude, and then there's, you know, other categories. So Venezuela is not the most robust as far as what you would want to find, but they do have a lot of it. So again, I think that uh, it's just a back and forth political talk at this point. Uh, and, you know, you think um, outside the box, obviously, you know, what we see on the Financial Times may be information, may be disinformation, may be misinformation, or more likely a combination of all three. So my thinking is, <clears throat> I'll wait and see. The U.S. isn't in any big problem right now. The strategic oil reserves has gone and doing this by memory from, I think, 540 million down to 420. We lost 100 million in our reserves already. <clears throat> and that's without uh, any real crunch. I did make some notes, but I want to get your thoughts on what I just said. Oh, uh, well, I definitely uh, think that um, maybe there might not be any Venezuelan oil coming into the United States in the near future. But it seems to me if the Venezuela starts shipping uh, oil to the United States, that will probably uh, start lowering the cost of oil and gasoline, I, would, I assume, if they allowed that. Because we saw during the 1950s how Venezuela was, you know, really in bed with the United States, how it was sending in a, a lot of oil uh, back then. And pretty much back then, people were getting oil really cheap. They had big gas guzzler cars. Uh, but then their whole oil industry kind of went in tatters. Uh, I don't even think they have very many refineries. I guess they have Iran is coming and fixing some of their refineries for them, um, which I find pretty strange. And then Russia is in there as well. So Russia could actually be getting a lot of its oil from Venezuela, or actually it is because we see them uh, getting oil right now. I kind of wanted to get your thoughts, David. Do you think oil will continue to go up and continue to skyrocket, or do you think it'll start, start to come down? I think it'll continue to go up. I think if there's any mitigation in this Ukraine situation, it will come down for a while. But I think the trend is higher and higher. Here's some notes I made from oilprice.com. The U.S. companies, oil companies, are producing one and a half million barrels less per day than they were a couple of years ago. Some of that has to do with, with uh, fracking. And uh, fracking is not all it's cracked up to be, pun intended. OPEC is in a similar situation, and they're being cautious. Only Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates have significant spare capacity, and even those come into question as far as how much. Um, we don't know, but obviously more, they have much more reserves than the United States, as we just discussed. And even they cannot make up for what the Russians' uh, exports are uh, to, the, to the globe. Again, not much gets to the U.S., but it does to other countries. All right. Across the pond, Europe is in an energy crisis, and energy prices have skyrocketed in inventories. They don't have any. I mean, they don't really have any <clears throat> production to speak of. And the natural gas supplier is primarily Russia. So the pressure's on to find any alternatives or to use liquid natural gas, which we're exporting, obviously, and try to head off this. And this is all with the uh, driving season coming up in a couple of months when the weather gets better. So I think you're going to see continued pressure on the oil price uh, for months to come. Yeah, I think uh, that's probably right. So we're probably going to be seeing... Like in the next few months, uh, months, how much do you think gasoline is going to go to? That's a tough one. I know you're in California, here in Washington. Actually, I haven't gone yet. I was going to go today and fill up my, my vehicle. Uh, I think you're going to see $5. I drive diesel. Well, I have a gas truck and a diesel car. Um, I think we're going to see $5 here in Washington at some point. Yeah, California is higher than that in a lot of places. Yeah, it seems like uh, it's pretty strange because they're talking about uh, California gas uh, rebates and everything. And there's actually, I think there's a federal tax on gasoline as well. But we're seeing a lot of states, you know, they have really high um, gas taxes like California. Like California has like a dollar gasoline prices out of all the states. Uh, and also a few other states have gasoline taxes. Do you think... Uh, we're going to start seeing states like California getting rid of their uh, gas tax so their consumers can actually buy gasoline, or do you think they're going to keep those in place? Well, that's a political question, and I <clears throat> love politics, as you know. 
being facetious here. I don't know. I don't know what the political climate is. Usually whenever the government takes something, they're very remiss to give it back. So my guess would be, no, they might talk about it, but it won't happen. Yeah, so we're probably going to see, you know, this whole oil crisis start moving us into the Green New Deal, more electric type vehicles and stuff like that, probably. Uh, is that kind of your thought or do you think? Uh, yeah, I agree. I think the push is definitely there. How much manifest remains to be decided. I mean, uh, you know, just think of all the gas and diesel powered vehicles out there on the road right now on the planet and how much of that is electrified. And how fast can you move from those you know, billions to, you know, 10% of the market, 20% of the market, half the market. I mean, you can mandate by 2029 or 2028 or pick a number and say you got to have an EV. That doesn't, just because they put it down on a piece of paper doesn't mean it's going to happen. So <clears throat> I am a little concerned about what's going on in the oil space and a lot of other things, of course. But um, I'm going to go ahead and close this out. I think it was a good briefing. We can dive deeper into oil. But uh, before we close out, I'd like you to give out your uh, contact points and also what you do with your videos because, uh, you know, it's great to see someone at your age come in with the kind of uh, zest that you have and uh, an open mind and a mind that uh, critical thinker that can uh, question everything, even if it comes from a trusted source like the Financial Times. So how do people learn more about you and what are your YouTube channels? Oh, uh, well, if you want to learn more about me, you can check out my channel, The Free American Press. I just post videos there and I do uh, interviews uh, with people about, you know, financials and, uh, you know, where the world is heading. And, uh, and I just really uh, like freedom. And I think we need to see freedom in the United States. So that's why I started The Free American Press. Uh, just so we can start getting our freedoms back and, you know, cutting taxes and try to make the United States a better place. Great. Well, thank you, Alex. It's been uh, nice having a conversation with you. I'll have to do it again. Sounds good, David. Well, thank you for uh, uh, letting me be on your show. Uh, you're welcome.